Center for the Humanities and Professor of English. And I'm just really delighted to be welcoming you um, virtually and in person today. I've been off for a year, so this is kind of fun for me to be back. Um, today's event is the first of our Fall 2022 Humanities Forum Lecture Series. Um, and it's a, a free public lecture series representing the, the best and most exciting work in the humanities in a spirit of lively inquiry and questions and answers. So I hope that you will, um, you know, you experience that today um, and also consider coming back for our next one, which is on October 20th at 4 p.m. And we'll be partnering that day with UMBC's Latinx and Hispanic Faculty Association to present uh, the artist and theorist Micha Chardines, assistant professor uh, of performance play and design and critical race and ethnic studies and director of critical, the Critical Realities Studio at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Only Santa Cruz has those studios. So it's like, um, in a t she's in a talk about um, poetic operations, trans ecologies, and queer oceans, uh, which, which is uh, the title of her recent book. And it considers uh, contemporary digital media, artwork, and poetry to articulate trans of color strategies for safety and survival. Um, that event is going to be on WebEx. Um, so uh, I encourage you to take a look at the Dresher Center website. That's dreshercenter.umbc.edu. Um, and you can also always connect with us on social media. Um, before we turn to today's program, I would like to make some quick other announcements. First, I want to acknowledge that UMBC was established upon the land of the Piscataway and Susquehannock peoples. Over time, citizens of many more indigenous nations have come to reside in this region. We humbly offer our respects to all past, present, and future indigenous people connected to this place. And while we recognize the importance of acknowledging those who came before us, we also know that voicing that truth is just a small gesture and that we must take action towards the necessary work of repair. This afternoon's event is being live streamed and will be made available on the UMBC YouTube page immediately after the event. And finally, I want to thank the Department of Ancient Studies for organizing today's event, particularly David Rosenblum, chair, who will now introduce our speaker. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you for having our program uh, in the Humanities Forum. I'd like to welcome uh, Professor uh, Sylvia Montilio uh, heartily and um, with the greatest respect and admiration to the UMBC campus on behalf of the department and on behalf of the Humanities Forum. I first met uh, Professor Montilio 31 years ago. We were both working diligently on our dissertations in a room no bigger than a closet with two computers, a printer, little ventilation, and no elbow room. And it's fitting, Sylvia's first book was an exhaustive and groundbreaking study of silence in Greek literature, covering four centuries and at least five genres, from Homer to Demosthenes. We were often silent. Through the years, our paths crossed mainly at conferences until she became Gildersleeve Professor in Classics at Johns Hopkins University. And she took up the appointment in 2009. And I came to UMBC in 2012. Professor Montilio is the author of seven single authored books, one co authored book, two co edited volumes. She's published 31 articles and book chapters that cover a mind boggling range of subjects. Her magnum opus, a two volume edition translation, translation and commentary on Heliodorus's Ethiopica, the Ethiopian Tales, is about to be published in Italian. In addition to her seminal book on silence in Greek literature, Professor Montilio has written a book on displacement and wandering among ancient intellectuals, and another on the figure of Odysseus, wanderer par excellence, as he advanced from villain in 5th century BC Athens to the hero of the more cosmopolitan Hellenistic philosophers. Professor Montilio has also written about the darker side of the human condition, 
She co-authored a book with Alessandro Schiazzaro on oblivion and catastrophes in the ancient world and on sleep and sleeplessness in Greek literature. She did a translation and commentary on the Renaissance scholar, uh, Geralimo Cardano's De Somnis Libri, his books on dreams. In recent years, Professor Montilio has gained a reputation as one of the foremost scholars of the ancient novel. She's written a book, Love and Providence, Recognition in the Greek Novel, and a, a co-edited volume of essays on philosophy and the ancient Greek novel, in addition to publishing numerous articles and book chapters on the many dimensions of the ancient novel. Throughout the great range and variety of her work, Professor Montilio combines thoroughness with concision, complexity of thought with simplicity of expression, creativity and originality with logical and convincing argumentation. The indomitable and tragic power of love is a conspicuous theme in Professor Montilio's work. She's published a book on the legend of the doomed lovers, Hero and Leander, separated and united by a narrow mile and a half of water that marked one of the biggest differences of the day, even up today, that between Europe, Leander, and Asia, Hero. More recently, she's published a Greek text, translation, and commentary on Musius' version of that story. Today, Professor Motilio will author something, as Monty Python would say, completely different. The first fruits of her most recent project, A History of the Emotion Schadenfreude in Antiquity. The title of her talk is An Immoral Emotion, Schadenfreude in the Iliad and the Odyssey. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Silvia Montilio. First, a technological handicap. I am technologically challenged, so let's see how this goes. Is it? Wait. Okay. Is it all right? Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. I want to thank, uh, uh, I would say, Professor Rosenblum here for this introduction, which uh, uh, I'm glad I was wearing a mask because I was blushing all over, you know. <laughs> hyperbole, I didn't know that hyperbole was uh, one of your mode. mode uh, where did I put my? Yeah, no, it's this one. Okay, it's here, right. And I also want to extend my thanks to Emily Hubbard, who has been a fabulous uh, organizer in all practical matters with generosity and punctuality, and who is here today, which doesn't happen often, you know, to have our administrative assistant participate in such events. So thank you, Emily, as well. What I want, uh, thank you all for being here. It's a nice crowd on uh, uh, something like a sunny day. So what I'm going to present today, it's not exactly a jolly topic. Schadenfreude, obviously not, but I would like you to, uh, I want to make you see how, you know, this emotion, like many others, is somewhat culturally determined. So what we think of Schadenfreude is not necessarily what uh, a Homeric, a Greek, especially in Homeric times, thought. So as you perhaps know, Schadenfreude is the adopted German word for joy in other people's misfortune. And it is one of the emotions currently fashionable in the media and in academia. In 2008, a reader of the New York Times lamented that we live in a golden age of schadenfreude. And this past February, an article in The Guardian followed suit. Philosophers, psychologists, sociologists, and historians of the emotions have been studying schadenfreude with ever-growing interest for a couple of decades. This trend, however, has not caught on among classical scholars, at least not with the same verve. And this is curious, because if ever there was a golden age of schadenfreude, it is probably not the years 2000 and plus, but the centuries of ancient Greek civilization. The Greeks were competitive, gossipy, litigious, abusive. And they enjoyed seeing their enemies, their rivals, and their neighbors fail and fall. Our focus today will be schadenfreude in Homeric epic. I will ask, which misfortunes cause the emotion? What are its effects? Do the gods feel it? Do the Iliad and the Odyssey treat it in the same way? But first, a few words about vocabulary and definitions, and this is handout one. Greek, unlike English, has a term roughly equivalent to schadenfreude, epichairekakia, literally, 
to rejoice, high rain, over a P, evil or badness, kakia. The term appears for the first time in Aristotle. Homer describes the experience of schadenfreude with phrases such as, for the victim, becoming an object of malicious pleasure or being a cause for gloating, while the subject is said to rejoice or to gladden his heart at the misfortune. Very often, he speaks taunting words. He laughs or exults over the unfortunate. The frequent couplings of malicious joy with exultation and mocking words of laughter bring out a major difference between the Homeric understanding of the emotion and our own. We tend to consider schadenfreude a furtive delight which we would not easily let out in public except when the targets are defeated politicians or sports teams. By contrast, in Homer, the pleasure often takes on a loud voice. By becoming audible, it can also become dangerous because of the key role of reputation in the definition of one's worth. A burst of rejoicing in someone else's failure or downfall further advertises that person's predicament, adding to the ruin of his reputation. While we think of schadenfreude primarily as the impish enjoyment of a spectator, inconsequential for its target. In many of its Homeric appearances, the pleasure in another's misfortune is endowed with an actively damaging force, which brings it close to our spite, malice, gloating, or derision. I will use schadenfreude and the kindred adjective schadenfro for lack of better words to describe the emotion's whole spectrum of applications in Homeric poetry but we have to keep in mind these key differences. And I will start on the battlefield of the Iliad, where fear of schadenfreude is most powerful. Military calamities are imagined to fill the enemy with a delight more hurtful than the calamity itself, including death that should cause it. This imagining turns into a nightmare for Agamemnon as he talks to his badly wounded brother, and out too. Then I will feel a terrible pain for you, Menelaus, if you die and feel the full measure of your destiny, and I will return to thirsty Argos in utter disgrace. The Greeks will instantly remember their fatherland, and we shall leave a boast to Priam and the Trojans, the Argive Helen, while your bones will rot as you lie on the Trojan plain, and the job will remain unfinished. And someone will say, one of the winning Trojans stampy on the grave of the famous Menelaus, Ha, may the anger of Agamemnon always end this way, as he now led here an army of Greeks in vain, then went back home to his fatherland, his ships empty, having left the brave Menelaus behind. So some will say, and on that day, may the broad earth open wide for me. Agamemnon does not dread his brother's death as much as its consequences for his own image. Homer spends only two lines on the pain Agamemnon will feel over the loss of his own flesh and blood, and 11 on the unbearable prospect of his shame and of the enemy's insulting exultation over Menelaus' death and Agamemnon's subsequent abandonment of the war efforts. The Greeks will want to depart, and they would leave behind a boast to Priam and the Trojans, Helen. Agamemnon doesn't say just Helen, but a boast, Helen, putting a premium, <coughs> excuse me, on the enemy's gloating, more devastating, it seems, than the loss of Helen herself. An ancient scholar finds the dreaded boast stirring. Commenting on the line, they would leave a boast to Priam and the Trojans, he says, the enemy's happiness is moving. The imagined gloating is poetically powerful because it would be dire for its victim. Its emotional impact in poetry depends on the grief it would cause in real life. Agamemnon is completely absorbed in his paranoid fantasy, which extends to the enemy's prancing with euphoric contempt on Menelaus's tomb. And this picture of a gleefully dancing and mocking Trojan holds up to Agamemnon the coup de grace. Fear of schadenfreude endows the emotion with a constructive social role as a sanctioning force, a deterrent against shameful or deceptive behavior. And up three. Nestor hopes to pacify Agamemnon and Achilles by evoking the joy their quarrel will give to the Trojans. Alas, a great pain has come today for Greece, 
Priam would indeed rejoice, and Priam's sons and the other Trojans would be glad in their heart if they should learn all this about the fighting of the two of you who surpass the other Greeks in council and in war. On the battlefield, the same fear of schadenfreude is exploited to prevent cowardliness or to bring stragglers back into the fray. Hector rebukes Paris by brandishing the enemy's exultation for, at his lack of martial virtue. And perhaps the long-haired Greeks will rejoice, saying that you are a great champion with your good looks but no strength or courage in your heart. Paris and the audience are made to hear the ugly sound of that jubilation in the line, Epu kan si kare komontes achaioi which is a harsh, throaty, and musical line. And again, Helenus urges Hector and Aeneas to keep the Trojan troops from fleeing, lest they become a laughing stock for the enemies. And Nestor preemptively exhorts the Greeks, who are keeping watch, not to fall asleep, lest we become a laughing stock for the enemies. The threat of schadenfreude contributes to bringing about or preserving the desired behavior in every instance except the first, where the quarrel of Achilles and Agamemnon would come to a premature end. The effectiveness of looming schadenfreude as a booster of courage and stamina further demonstrates how dangerous the emotion could be felt to be. A Homeric warrior is sensitive to the warning that the enemy will laugh at his failure, and this dreaded prospect keeps him in the fighting ranks. Two more causes of schadenfreude in the Iliad are deformity and corporal punishment. Well-known episode. When Thersites, the ugliest of the Greeks, finishes his attack on Agamemnon, Odysseus beats him in front of all the soldiers, causing a bloody welt to rise on his back and a tear to stream down his cheek. Hand out four. He sat down, frightened, and in pain, looking helplessly, he wiped off his tear. And they, though sorely vexed, laughed with pleasure at him. This laughter is roused by the visible humiliation and suffering of the beaten man, as pointed up especially by the opposition Dacru, Tia, Gelassan, they laughed, at the last two line endings. The sight of him has the same effect that he always seeks to achieve by his speeches, for Thersites is a comedian who says whatever he thinks will rouse a good laughter among the Greeks. A schadenfro laughter, that is, one sparked by abuse of the leaders. This proclivity of his made him hateful to his targets, but must have found favor at least with some soldiers, giving them the opportunity to enjoy a good laugh at the expense of others. In this circumstance, however, he fails. The producer of ridicule becomes himself the target of a schadenfro laughter. The laughter has socially desirable effects. It cures the soldiers' distress and unwillingness to fight, realigning them to the cause of the war. But who will join in the laughter? Readers ancient and modern compare the occasion that rouses it with the athletic discomfiture of the lesser Ajax, which, as we shall see presently, causes the other heroes to laugh with pleasure in the same words. The pairing suggests that the crowd's laughter at Thersites could be shared by the heroes, the same who laugh at Ajax that enjoying the spectacle of ugliness, pain, and humiliation each fully belongs in the heroic code of conduct. While laughing at a beaten and misshapen Thersites made uglier by his tears would be objectionable in contemporary Western societies, well, except for some politicians, uh, a Homeric audience quite likely went along with the soldiers, as is suggested also by the unanimity of their laughter. Another trigger of schadenfreude, this one more acceptable in the modern world, is defeat in sports. In the funeral games organized by Achilles in honor of Patroclus, Athena causes the lesser Ajax to slip during the course race. Odysseus wins, and Ajax, spitting out cow dung, says, and out five, ah, Athena made me trip. She stands as before by Odysseus, by Odysseus' side, and helps him like a mother. Thus he spoke, and all laughed with pleasure at him. Likewise, when Epeius fails to throw a huge lump of iron, all the Achaeans laughed. Both instances of laughter stem for a harmless schadenfreude. What follows the first is quite lighthearted. 
Antilochus, the loser, takes his prize, half a talent of gold, smiling. He makes a joke about gods favoring the old, praises Achilles, the match runner, and receives more gold in return. If these episodes of Schadenfreude are benign and light, however, it is not because Schadenfreude in the Greek world of sports is always benign and light. Pindar proves the opposite, picturing as he does losers who are shamed into hiding to avoid the mockery of enemies watching them. And even in the games for Patroclus, Nestor warns his son Antilochus that a chariot racer who wrecks his chariot will be joy for the others, shame for himself. So this phrase harks back to the warnings against Schadenfreude on the battlefield, especially to Hector's rebuse of Paris, of Paris for his lack of martial valor, suggesting to the attentive listener that losing sports is as shameful as losing at war and can excite the same malicious glee in the opponents and in the watchers. Rather than being connaturate with sport events, the good-natured laughter that meets Ajax's and Epeius's failures harmonizes with the urbane spirit of these particular games, which are under the aegis of a gracious host, Achilles, and in which, as is very rarely the case in the Greek world of sports, even losers get prizes. Furthermore, the light-hearted laughters serve to build a stark contrast with the aggressive exaltation of winners on the battlefield, where the stakes are not prizes, but life or death. As Oliver Taplin puts it, while in the games there is danger and excitement, there is no death and no damage worse than broken bones or being laughed at. In a friendly spirit, I will add, being a joy for others, Nestor's fear, in the arena of these special games means no more than providing the good fun of an inconsequential schadenfreude. And now we move to the gods, for they are not immune to schadenfreude. At the party that puts an end to the quarrel of Zeus and Hera in Iliad I, Hephaestus limps around pouring nectar. And, in about six, an unquenchable laughter rose among the blessed gods as they saw Hephaestus limping in the palace. Critics have debated whether the gods laugh at Hephaestus or with him. The cause of their merriment, his gait, suggests that they enjoy the spectacle of his deformity, all the funnier because of the role he plays. As Jeffrey Kirk notes, ancient commentators are probably correct to say that part of the comic effect lies in the lame god performing the job of the cupbearer, properly the duty of comely Hebe or Ganymede. Hephaestus' service, however, puts the finishing touch on his diplomatic efforts, aimed to relieve the tensions between Hera and Zeus and to restore peace and fun among the feasting gods. He has just caused Hera to smile by dwelling on his fall on the island of Lemnos, and now he offers himself as a spectacle and succeeds. On this reading, the laughter applauds the comedian, joining in with his self-mockery. Hephaestus is not pained by it, but continues his laugh-rousing job at the banquet until sundown. The laughter has the same power of diffusing tensions as the one of Thersites, but while the soldier's amusement feeds off the suffering and ugliness of the Lathi and signs off on his punishment, marking his exit, the god's unquenchable laughter brings back order and good mood without harming its target who, on the contrary, participates in the collective gaiety. The main source of divine schadenfreude, however, has no parallel in the human world. It is the war, which brings humans destruction and tears. Because the Iliadic gods draw pleasure from watching it, they have invited comparison with the muses described in the Homeric hymn to Apollo, who find inspiration in the dismal condition of mortals, handout seven. And all the muses, with their beautiful voices, sing in antiphony about the immortal gifts of the gods and the sufferings of men, which they receive from the gods to live senselessly, helplessly, unable to find a cure against death and a remedy against old age. For these gods, human misery is an even more delightful subject of song than their own bliss. While their immortal gifts are not detailed, the sufferings of men warrant an expansive development that includes the mention of the gods as givers 
adding a sadistic hue to their schadenfreude. The Homeric gods are not as cruelly self-indulgent. They do not go as far as singing about the sufferings of men, but content themselves with watching them fight. Yet, the spectacle is a grim one, for inevitably it includes killing and dying. As the Greeks and the Trojans are closing in to fight, Ares, who brings much mourning, rejoiced, looking over. The goddess's pleasure is midway between sadism and schadenfreude, for she's enjoying the result of her own rousing action, but as a spectator. At the book's opening, Zeus launches Ares toward the ships. She takes her stand on Odysseus's and shouts loudly in a shrill voice, infusing great strength into each of the Greeks. Now, Ares is thrilled at the spectacle because of the great mourning, oh, how delightful to her, that the fight will generate. The chilling juxtaposition, she rejoiced in echairepolustonos, these two words together, which are an oxymoron, joy and tears and mourning, epitomizes the essence of this goddess who is happy both to give and to watch grief. The same battle fills Zeus with pleasure but from a greater distance, that's 8b. The father did not care for the other gods, but went aside and sitting apart from the others, exalted in his glory and watched the city of Troy and the Achaean ships and the flesh of bronze, those killing and those being killed. While Ares stands near the fighters, watching them with an involved, bloodthirsty eye, Zeus sits afar, even from the other gods, and basks in his solitary splendor, feeding it with the spectacle of the war below. His eye is as aloof as his location and as his attitude to the other gods, and he takes in with the same detachment the theater of the war, the glimmering weapons, and the multiple deaths. The flesh of bronze, those killing and those being killed, do not affect him differently. Zeus is the god who draws pleasure from the spectacle of war and death more often and from the most removed position. He seems to think that he has the exclusive right to sit back, relax, and enjoy the show of the war. At the beginning of Iliad IV, as all the gods sit around drinking nectar and watching Troy, he taunts his wife because she and Athena should help Menelaus, and instead, sitting apart, they watch and enjoy themselves. Conversely, the god who never goes down to fight and can afford even to look forward to the pleasure he will derive from watching the raging of war. 8c. I think about them, Zeus tells Poseidon, dying as they are. Even so, I will stay in the fold of Olympus where I will watch and please my heart. The other gods, he continues, can go down and fight by whichever side they wish. An ancient cricket critic denies that Zeus is anticipating schadenfreude, claiming that the god is happy because of the sparing of the day of gloom when Troy will be taken. This writer shows discomfort with the assertion that Zeus would enjoy watching people suffer and die and attempts to explain his pleasure as genuine relief at delayed suffering. This endearing acrobatics to clear Zeus of schadenfreude reveals a keenness on defending Homer's morality against all odds. Modern interpreters, however, are divided on the source of Zeus's anticipated delight. Mark Edwards argues that Zeus expects enjoyment primarily from the preposterous divine conflict, not the human disaster. For Jasper Griffin, on the other hand, the god takes pleasure in watching men suffer. As we shall see presently, Zeus will find the gods at war amusing. But in this passage, he rather seems to relish the prospect of watching the human fray. He says, I think about them. Nonetheless, I will stay here and watch. That is, my concern for dying mortals will not keep, him, keep me from enjoying the spectacle or their fighting and dying. As the fight continues, Zeus again, 80, laughed with pleasure in his heart as he saw the gods closing in with each other in battle. Ancient commentators again tried to clear Zeus of schadenfreude does not enjoy the, fly, the fight, they claim, but the gods contending for valor. As in the Odyssey, Agamemnon is reporting to enjoy watching the best man, Odysseus and Achilles, quarrel, so now as well, Zeus rejoices in a good fight. Well, gods obviously do not die. The divine fight 
may therefore seem to warrant comparison with the quarrel of Odysseus and Achilles, which is violent but not deadly and takes place in the peaceful setting of a bountiful feast. If we put a premium on the gods' deathlessness, Zeus delights not in a spectacle filled with pain, but in a context, a contest that is both flamboyant and ridiculous, both a display of divine power and a parody of a real battle in which one could be killed. However, Zeus's delight has a wicked hue, for he, the deathless gods struggle under his eyes. Scamander has to plead with Hephaestus to stop burning him. Ares, wounded by Athena, groans and almost faints. Athena, withdrawing her heart, punches Aphrodite, who collapses and takes Ares down with her. Artemis, jeered at, beaten, and caused to weep by Hera, goes up to Olympus and sits on Zeus's lap in tears, and he laughs pleasantly, showing, in Stephen Halliwell's words, a hint of amusement at his daughter's discomfiture. The god's violence has comical overtones, and the pain is not serious, tears at the most. But the pain is as serious as divine pain can be, and Zeus is thrilled at the spectacle. Now, will the audience share in Zeus's pleasure? Not when it takes in the sight of those killing and those being killed. This, this description will rather make the listeners shudder at the thought that human deaths can provide a god's amusement. More ambivalent, I think, will be the audience's response to Zeus's pleasure at the fight of the other gods. On the one hand, as we have seen, the gods clashing appears amusing, even ridiculous. Furthermore, a god's predicament could be savored with detachment and with the added satisfaction of seeing the powerful brought low. The spectacle of Ares falling down with Aphrodite must have given as much delight to the audience as to Zeus. Ha, the god of war tumbling, dragged down by his lover. But on the other hand, precisely the ridiculousness of the divine battle will throw the seriousness of its human counterpart into sharp relief and awaken in the audience the joyless sentiment of its mortality. And now, with your indulgence, I move on to the Odyssey. Where Schadenfreude carries negative connotations that are absent from the Iliad. The humans who experience or are imagined to experience the emotion in the Iliad are unmarked groups or individuals. One of the Trojans, one of the Greeks, the enemy, the heroes watching the games, the soldiers laughing at Thersites. Schadenfreude is not a token of badness, but is the expected reaction to misfortune. On the battlefield, the one qualification to its acceptability is that it must be targeted against the enemy. Schadenfreude at the debacle of one's friends is a sign of meanness and folly as in this picture of Achilles made up by Poseidon at the climax of the Greek disaster in Iliad 14 and Doubt 9. Son of Atreus, now perhaps Achilles' ruinous heart rejoices in his chest as he watches the slaughter and the panic of the Greeks, since he has no sense, not the slightest, but may he be damned and may a god cripple him. To console Agamemnon, Poseidon tells him that the Greek defeat is not to be blamed on his incompetence, but on Achilles' foolishness, which now, he assumes, will take the shape of the heartless schadenfreude at the disaster of his own people. This is the one time in the Iliad that schadenfreude serves to throw a negative light onto a character, and it is a perverted kind of schadenfreude, i.e. over the ruin of friends. The emotions appears more rarely in the Odyssey, and its, but its manifestations in human society are never morally neutral or unchallenged. It is almost exclusively associated with the suitors and serves to highlight their lack of restraint and their overweening and delusional confidence. This is apparent in the episode of the boxing match between the beggar Eros and Odysseus. At the sight of Eros falling down, beaten, the suitors and doubt and A, raised their hands and died with laughter, a blood-filled laughter, which stands opposite to the hero's benign laughter at the losing athletes in Iliad 23. The outburst releases the pseudo's excitement in anticipation of the match. When the beggar challenges Odysseus, Antinous, laughing out with pleasure, exclaims, friends, 
Never before has something like this happened. Such is the delight that the god has brought to this house. Antinous savors the prospect of the fight and is joined by the other suitors who also laugh and get up together around the contenders. These two fits of laughter build up to the final explosion, which comes right after the graphic description of Eris' broken body, tying the two together. The suitors die with laughter at the sight of a wounded man screaming in pain, a man, furthermore, whose sorry defeat they have been anticipating with relish. For Eros, the challenger, becomes timid at the sight of Odysseus's mighty thigh. He takes to trembling, and Antinous, who could not wait to watch the fight, forces him into it, threatening him in case he should lose, with sending him off to a king who would cut off his nose, ears, and penis and serve them to the, god, to the dogs. As a result of the threat, Eros trembles even more, the bottomless laughter responds to the much-awaited beating of the weak, fearful, and unwilling falter. The phrase, they died with laughter, occurs only in this passage in Homer. It denotes an immoderate guffaw, as perhaps that does the verb ekgelao that describes Antino's first outburst. Both the verb and the phrase are reserved for the suitors, who have a proclivity for inappropriate laughter and hubristic behavior. Soon after the Eros episode, they laugh again at the display of violence, this time to applaud the mockery of Odysseus's shining bold pate with which Eurymachus regals them. And thou ten be. Eurymachus, son of Polybus, began to speak to them, taunting Odysseus, and roused laughter in his companions. One suitor's gleeful derision excites more schadenfreude, which finds expression in a mocking laughter. The sight of a man badly beaten by words or fists is a great source of entertainment for the bored and unfettered suitors. Both episodes, however, bespeak the suitor's blindness. Odysseus is shining fate, the target of their derision, conjures up the flame, a harbinger of doom, that radiates from Achilles' head as reappears on the battlefield in Iliad 18. Eurymachus is thus unwittingly casting the decrepit beggar as his soon-to-be killer by a pointed allusion that emphasizes Odysseus's superhuman, God-given strength rather than his defenseless old age. The pseudo's bottomless laughter at Eros is even more chillingly misplaced for his fall dripping with blood foreshadows their much bloodier death. As Anne Burnett notes, the episode is a play within the play, which sets up the external audience to watch an inner audience of suitors as they applaud the representation of their own imminent destruction. These internal spectators burst into laughter without knowing that they are proleptically laughing at their own demise. Their schadenfreude has a cutting irony, foregrounded by the very expression, they died with laughter, which Burnett calls the creation of a malicious poet Malicious indeed, because he's about to make the suitors die almost while laughing. Many a laughter of theirs resounds during this book and beyond, most tellingly as they fix their last meal, unknowingly anticipating its tastiness. And out and see. Laughing, they prepare the pleasant and plentiful meal, for they had sacrificed very many victims. But no other meal would be more unpleasant than this one, such as a goddess and a valiant man were about to set up for them. Here, the poet explicates the pseudo's nescience and spells out their coming doom, whereas the foreshadowing of their death in Eros' beating is left implicit. But the audience, which knows that soon the laughing pseudos will replace Eros, enjoys their blind schadenfreude with its own schadenfreude, both at their blindness and in anticipation of their death. Displays of schadenfreude are thus a signature feature of the poem's bad guys. There is, it is true, another character who would give bent to the emotion, and a good one, Euryclea, at discovering the dead suitors. But Odysseus, Odysseus hushes her. 11a. As she saw the dead bodies of blood immeasurable, she was ready to utter a cry of jubilation, for great was the deed she saw. But Odysseus restrained her and stopped her, though she was eager. 
and speaking to her, he said these winged words. In your heart rejoice, old woman. Stop and do not cry out with jubilation. It is impious to boast over dead men. The gods' destiny killed them and their evil deeds. Odysseus condemns boasting with a generalizing statement that questions a pillar of Iliadic heroics and extends to schadenfreude. It is worth stressing that he exhorts Eurycleia to keep her joy within, not to eradicate it altogether. Christian preaching would not admit this distinction between a vocal and a silent schadenfreude and his allowing the latter, but bans the emotions even from one's heart. Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth. Eurycleia, in contrast, is not made to feel uncomfortable with savoring the emotion within herself. As it seems, schadenfreude, if unexpressed, loses its offensive quality and its damaging power. It does not reach the dead and will not attract the nemesis of the gods. It is also worth stressing that it is not Odysseus as character that objects to exalting over the dead, but the Odysseus of the Odyssey. In the Iliad, Odysseus does not refrain from gloating over a warrior he has killed, whereas during the slaughter of the suitors, which is his most Iliadic feat in the Odyssey, he never taunts his victims as he holds them in his grip. It is his helpers who indulge in this Iliadic, Iliadic pleasure. Odysseus' suppression of Eurycleia's desire to cry out with joy is thus consistent with his own behavior in the second epic and serves to portray him as the opposite of the suitors to throw his moderation into bold relief. Eurycleia does not learn the lesson. At the opening of Book 23, she goes up the stairs, exulting, eager to tell Penelope that her husband is in the house. Granted, Caricleia is not rejoicing in public, and, but she's alone, and her exultation is linked to the excitement of announcing Odysseus's presence to her mistress. But she's still relishing the sight of the dead, as her words to Penelope made clear, 12. Then I found Odysseus standing among the bodies of the killed. They lay around him, one on top of the other on the hard soil. Seeing this, you would have rejoiced in your heart. It is the spectacle of the slaughtered man that is still pleasing Eurycleia and should please her mistress. But Penelope stops her and speaks words similar to Odysseus 13. Mommy dear, don't exalt and gloat yet. One of the gods has killed the illustrious suitors, enraged by their insolence, a pain for the heart, and by their evil deeds. Though Penelope's reason for restraining Eurycleia is her incredulity, rather than a moral objection to gloating, she says, don't exalt yet. The nurse's joy is once again silenced. Schadenfreude, in the human world of the Odyssey, is never allowed free reign except when in the mouth of the worst sect of the epic. Things sit differently from the god, for the gods. They are free to give Schadenfreude a loud voice without their behavior bearing a stigma. I am thinking of their roaring laughter at Ares and Aphrodite in the song of Demodocus. When Hephaestus summons the other gods to watch the couple caught in adultery and trapped, he wants them to laugh, 14a. Come here to watch things that are worthy of ridicule and not tolerable. Hephaestus invites the god to ridicule the adulterous couple and thus to redress his honor. He wants them to take his intolerable predicament seriously and to avenge him by laughing at the pair instead of laughing at him. A Homeric audience might have had in mind warnings of the kind Hesiod prefers to a man who wants, wishes to marry. Hesiod says, look all around, lest your marriage will give delight to your neighbor. Hephaestus might want to avert this kind of schadenfreude by turning the offending couple into the object of mockery, as adulterers could be in real life. And indeed, the divine assembly laughs, 14b. An unquenchable laughter rose among the blessed gods as they saw the art technus of the ingenious Hephaestus. The laughter, however, does not fulfill Hephaestus' wishes. It is not censorious, but bespeaks a bubbly pleasure at the spectacle of the crafty net of the two beautiful naked bodies surrounded by it, and perhaps especially of Ares's predicament. An all-male congress 
The gods erupt into laughter at seeing the most macho of them, the strongest and roughest, immobilized through the devices of his physically disabled victim. This emphasis becomes clear in the conversation that follows. After issuing a shallow moral comment, bad actions don't succeed, the gods set to the two antagonists, the slow and the fast god, against each other and declare the slow the winner, thanks to his technite arts. This appreciation for Hephaestus' craft and the repetition of technai stress again the discovery of the ingenious net as an additional spur to their laughter. The gods who enjoy the entrapment of muscular errors also enjoy the cleverness of the artist, ingenious like Odysseus. All moral dusting is wiped off from the gods' disposition by the ensuing banter between Apollo and Hermes, which in turn excites another laughter. Would you choose to be trapped like this if you could sleep with Aphrodite? Apollo asks. Oh, yes, may three times as many endless chains surround me. May you all, gods and goddesses, watch. But may I sleep by the side of golden Aphrodite, is Hermes' answer. 14c, so he said, and a laughter rose among the immortal gods. The gods applaud the raciness of Hermes' wish, which challenges both their own previous moral comment and the humiliating force of the couple's entrapment and exposure. The gods' amoral and good-humored laugh impresses on us the difference between gods and men, reminding us that this is not a human society, that the consequences of actions are not as serious. Against this reading, it could be argued that both laughters are humiliating for the very instigator of the first, that Hephaestus' revenge backfires. So Robert Garland, I quote, Hephaestus unwittingly exposes Aphrodite to the lustful gaze of gods and men. In exacting his revenge, he thus contrives his own very public humiliation, end quote. We could add that the exposure of his pretty wife compounds his exposure of his own dishonor, ugliness, and sadness. Summoning the gods, Hephaestus protests that the reason why Aphrodite holds him in disfavor and loves Ruinos Ares is his own limp and Ares's beauty and soundless of limbs. And he does not hide his dejection. Come watch where the two lie in love, having gone to my bed, but I, watching this, grieve. Hephaestus broadcasts his humiliation, then his misery, while at the same time inviting the gods to watch the scene that causes his humiliation and his misery. Hermes' wish exposes Aphrodite further to the public eye by fashioning a replica of this scene with him as male partner and the gods and goddesses watching while only the gods are doing so in reality. This enhanced gazing on the double plane of reality and fantasy and extended to include the goddesses could have the effect of increasing Hephaestus' humiliation. But there is no indication that this is the case, in my opinion. Homer says, a laughter rose among the immortal gods, but Poseidon did not laugh, where he could have added or said, you know, but Hephaestus did not laugh or was grieved, as he had done before. Hephaestus has given delight to his neighbors in Hesiod's words, but a harmless delight in which a naughty schadenfreude at the captive couple, especially at the impeded heiress, mixes with admiration for the smith's craftiness and both pleasures are superseded by the titillation of a dirty joke. Neither laughter was meant to hurt Hephaestus. The adulterous gods are not hurt either and lose none of their glorious properties. As soon as they are released, they depart without shame, but for a hint at their rushing off. Heiress to Thrace, with which he has a special connection, and Aphrodite, lover of smiles, to her holy paphos, where she's pampered with a beauty treatment and dressed in finery, as if nothing had happened. Aphrodite is called the lover of smiles only here in the Odyssey, probably to suggest that her eroticism remains intact. Her clothes, lovely and a wonder to behold, have the song's last words. While in the real human world, mockery at adulterers cut through their flesh, the gods' unquenchable laughter has only grazed at the skin's surface of its two divine victims. 
Will the external audience laugh with the gods? Halley will, though he leaves the possibility open, thinks that this would be tantamount to enjoying a laughter beyond morality, which clashes with the core plot of the Odyssey around the threat to Odysseus's bed. But Odysseus himself is taken with the song, handout 15. He was delighted in his heart listening, and so were the Phaeacians. Demodocus's audience, beginning with the human husband whose main concern is his wife's fidelity, finds pleasure in the risque story. It is true that this internal audience does not laugh, but to enjoy the song, it cannot find fault with the gods' double laughter or with the episode's happy ending. Homer's audience, likewise, will be delighted by the laughters, knowing that human morality does not apply to the gods. This is the only time in the Odyssey that the gods display schadenfreude, and the emotion targets other gods. In sharp contrast to the Iliad, the Odyssey does not feature gods enjoying the spectacle of human struggles. The Odyssean gods do watch humans, but to evaluate the righteousness of their actions rather than to be entertained by their troubles. When Antinous hits Odysseus, another suitor warns him that his victim could be a god in disguise, 16. And the gods, in the semblance of strangers from abroad, assume all sorts of shapes and wander about the cities, watching the insolence and the justice of men. Such morally concerned gods are involved spectators, and what they see spurs them to act, to mete out rewards and punishments. The divergence between the Iliad and the Odyssey in the treatment of divine schadenfreude thus seems related to a well-known difference in the theology of the two poems. In the Iliad, the gods behave capriciously and egotistically, with little or no sense of justice while in the Odyssey, they ensure that good people win and bad people lose. The musing about the gods going about to watch human behavior is emblematic of the Odyssey's optimistic vision because it is not in the mouth of Odysseus, the offended party who would naturally hope in divine retribution, but of one of the suitors who are indeed about to get their own deserts from the god Odysseus who is now watching them with Athena and Zeus as helpers. As it seems, the gods of the Odyssey don't have the aloofness that would allow them to draw pleasure from the spectacle of human struggles, because as patrons of justice, they are called to intervene in those struggles as helpers or destroyers. Zeus cannot sit back and enjoy the show as he does in the Iliad. Thank you. That's the fun part. Mm. Please, let me just put on my other glasses because so, so I can see you better. These are my reading, but these are too close if I find them. Okay. Okay, please. You mean if I am a Schadner, if I if I feel a lot of Schadenfreude myself? No. <laughs> well, actually, it's a good question. You know, I think what inspired is that I kept finding it in one way and the other, and uh, you know, a lot of work has been done on, on emotion in ancient Greek culture. You know, m most famously by David Constant, who's written on almost every emotion on the on the planet except for this one. And I contacted him. No, I probably others too. And I contacted him and I said, you know, have you done something? He said, well, Schadenfreude is just the opposite of envy. Schadenfreude is this, uh, the opposite of pity, the satisfaction of envy. So he dismissed it. And so I thought that it was actually a good topic. Well, dismiss it, not because he didn't want to work with it. And he thought perhaps that I was uh, poking and say, why didn't you work on this one? And I, I thought that it actually has a lot to say about Greek culture. Because, uh, you know, there isn't the Christian um, belief that, you know, your enemy, you should always uh, give the other cheek uh, and, you know, always forgive your enemy, etc. There isn't. And so it's a different, uh, a, a, as you have seen here, I think Schadenfreude is much more 
is recognized as, um, as a fact of life uh, and uh, more realistically, less repressed, perhaps. Um, so, so I think it, it was a kind of a vacuum, an absence of something, and the frustration with not finding work done on it, which is always actually what scholarship, you know, often scholarship is about that. You know, you find a lot of good work done on something. As I said, this wonderful book by David Constant, The Emotion, it's like a thousand pages, I don't know. And then you see this one, and I said, I, I can't find this one. And so you feel that you want to add something. So that, that's, uh, so, um, and I think also because um, I w I've been busy, in the, as uh, Professor Rosenblum was very kindly saying, with the ancient novels for a long time, where the ancient, no the ancient novel adopts a sort of a, a odyssey, theodicy, so that there is divine justice, and the good people win and the bad people lose. And so there, and, and there I said, this is quite, you know, so it's a kind of schadenfreude. You can have that too, there too, you know, being happy. But it's a morally, you know, it, it's a different one as opposed to your enemy falls. Uh, and it's not that your enemy is wrong. It's just that your enemy is your enemy. So I wanted to explore uh, the, the different dimensions, uh, different, the variations of schadenfreude. So I would say that. And then, you know, probably what uh, in the beginning I was saying, I could have said much more to, about the contemporary fashion with Schadenfreude, which, as I say, I'm surprised not to find work on Greek material. But uh, in contemporary, I mean, I must have found 50 articles, 10 books on the subject in, in modern philosophy, history, and uh, uh, many blame internet as a platform where Schadenfreude actually emerges, you know, in a sort of freewheeling way, because uh, you are protected in a way by the she by the screen, so you don't have to face, uh, you know, your the other person. And at the same time, you can. This is why on Facebook you're always supposed to put good news so that other people cannot take advantage of you. So I, I was reading all this stuff, and I said, of course, it doesn't apply. But you see, Greece, there was no internet, but it was a, such a face-to-face -face society that I think for this reason, you know, you were always in the public eye. So. So I don't know if I've satisfied you, but it is, a, it is an interesting emotion. And you know, I think the not admitting it, it's mean. Many philosophers are actually rehabilitating it nowadays. They think that uh, it, uh, it serves a very important purpose uh, in terms of self-esteem. So if you can, if you, if you see, you know, you know, everybody has this awfully, people who have it all, even if they're good people, you know. They're extremely handsome, they're successful, they're wealthy, uh, they have all the lovers they want, and then something goes wrong, you say, oh, at last, you know? <laughs> and you feel that there'll be a sort of almost existential comeuppance, you know? And you know, then you feel bad about it, but you also say, there must be some redress here, you know? Not everybody cannot just get COVID. Now, for example, I'm coming down from Florida, I'm weathering the storm, and I say, something has to go back, well, on the way back, right? <laughs> Anyway, thank you for this. this is a, actually a very genuine question, and those are the questions that make you think. Thank you very much. Young man. Do you believe that this concept of shot is sort of just as well applied to social media? Uh, well, you see, Aenea, that, that's a very different concept because there is destiny with Aenea. So it's not, uh, so in which way could it apply to Aenea? I mean, it's, he has to pursue a mission that he doesn't want to pursue, although the mission eventually turns out to be a good deal for him, right, in terms of posthumous glory. But uh, uh, I don't see, he weeps all the time, he's full of pity. On the, he seems to be rather a hero of compassion and of uh, sympathy. I, I, don't, I don't know, I mean, if anybody here could... But it will be, it, it will be I, I can look, at, if I find something, I'll let you know, but I, I wouldn't. At first sight, I wouldn't uh, consider the Aenea, the poem where Schadenfreude emerges. Yes, sir. You mean, why would they leave it as a possibility instead yeah, of condemning it? 
Oh, no, I don't. I think it's, I, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. Uh, like, uh, yeah, but you see, for a Christian, even in your heart, it would not be good. So I don't know how much more friendly you make it. Although, of course, then the Christian, I've been reading around Christian uh, material, too, and, you know, they're not, they preach one way and they go the other way, too. And because, you know, Tertullian has the, the, the most gory vision of the underworld with all the pagans being tortured and the angels uh, and the, the faithful contemplating them with great joy. So, you know, we have to be careful there. I think, you know, the Christians then have the enemy is the unbeliever. And so vis-a-vis -vis the unbeliever, you are allowed to experience any amount of schadenfreude and to cry it out loud. Yes? Well, I think it, it existed throughout. I don't think there is any culture. One thing about the emotions, we have to be careful when we talk, when we talk about cultural relativism because, it, again, I think it is some, sometimes it's overdone. There is also, you know, emotions are in a way universal. It's more a, a way of how they are expressed and how they're evaluated rather than whether they exist or not, I would think. So, um, well, now, of course, the objects, you know, now war well, until recently, it should not be a prominent concern of ours. And so schadenfreude is, uh, the areas of schadenfreude, for example, work is mentioned a lot in current psychological studies especially, and all statistics. The workplace is a chief environment of where schadenfreude thrives. Hmm? And probably in Greece, you know, we have no, ways, no way to say this, but certainly the rivalry, the idea that there is a famous line in Hesiod, you know, the potter is jealous of potter, poet or poet, so pro professional rivalry probably was also a similar. Uh, politics, uh, there is a lot of evidence for Greece. And, well, the Greeks insulted, insult was a, a practice that was much more prominent, although, you know, in, in our world it wasn't until some time ago, but now I see it is too. But because, you know, you go to the law courts uh, and there are insults exchanged uh, left and right, then the audience, because there was an audience to this event, could have exp exp experienced the kind of schadenfreude that, for example, in our law courts, I don't think is there the same way, because you're supposed to be civil, you know, the way you express yourself. Uh, then, of course, media, obviously, are different, so you, it, there wasn't... Uh, I'm trying to think, yeah, of course, there weren't newspapers. Sports, uh, sports for me is another... I'm not, I'm not a a, a sports fan, but I found that that is an era, interesting area of inquiry because now there is a lot of discussion about the ethics of schadenfreude in sports. And I think it's quite, you know, you have on the one hand, you know, who said, uh, who is the famous, the only victory, no, the only victory is, no, Vince Lombardi. Vince Lombardi. What is it exactly? Winning is yeah, it's the, a, only the only thing. Winning is the only thing. But then you also get the fair play, you know, uh, you have to kiss uh, the cheek of the other team uh, to congratulate the other team and say that they really fought a good, a good uh, match. Uh, you know, whereas in Greece, that was not the case. I mean, there was a, you won, it was a zero, what is called a zero-sum game. No one, no loser gets a consolation prize in every sense. And so Schadenfreude, you know, definitely was a more cruel, you know, we would say. But there too, you know, now we discuss it. We discuss, uh, is it something that is ethical or not? Can you actually jeer at the other team uh, when they, and can you jeer an athlete of the opposite team who, who falls down you know, and breaks a leg, for example? I think most people would say no. Whereas a Greek probably would say yes. So there is a level of tolerance. Uh, uh, I think our society, our world is driven by you know, the value of compassion, which wasn't there, and not just in ancient Greek. I mean, if you look at the Middle Ages, you know, you find many episodes, many, many episodes are comparable, I found, you know, producing cripple and celebrating and enjoying the spectacle in markets, etc., fairs. So, whereas our compassion, you know, 
kicks away schadenfreude, not in, 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 in fact, but it's in its acceptability in many ways. So, and, uh, yes. Okay. Well, ubiquitous. Well, I have to. I have to see. I'm just uh, starting on it. Yeah, okay, but I think okay. Well, a, be, um, a short answer, an easy one, but probably not entirely wrong, would be the absence of a word does not necessarily reflect the absence of the concept. And I, no, let me tell you why. Because otherwise, the Germans would have much more Schadenfreude than the English, since there is no English term either. And I do not. Well, you, you, and yeah, you. Okay. You know, I wonder whether, in part, the absence of a specific word uh, that is not technical as it becomes in Aristotle. Well, the philosophers keep using it, by the way. Huh? It, it, it stays on. It catches on very much with the Stoics. It catches on. Okay. Plutarch uses it a lot. Okay. Uh, Lucian uses it, so definitely in the okay, Roman. But still, there's quite a number of centuries that pass where yeah. it's really mm -hmm. Well, it could be, I think, that um, the vocal, you know, perhaps certain verbs like uh, exalt, you know, or even terpain seem to do the job. And, you know, you just use you just use periphrases instead of using, you know, of coining an abstract term. And I, uh, you know, I, I could agree, perhaps, uh, obviously, phthonos. By the way, phthonos can also mean schadenfreude in certain uh, Plato. Uh, Plato uses it with that meaning, too. So maybe there is an umbrella, you know, phthonos being the inclusive emotion. Uh, the reverse doesn't need to have a specific. So <coughs> I don't know if uh, I'm struck, actually, I'm already struck by the lack of conceptualization of this yeah. emotion as you know, con compare, compared to what is happening nowadays and compared to even what happens in the 19th century. Schopenhauer talks about it, Nietzsche talks about it, Kant talks about it, so you get, uh, but <coughs> maybe it could be because it's, it's so obvious, you know, you don't have to spec, you can always say when, what you find though is when uh, is legitimate and when it is not legitimate, but defining it, you really don't find definitions of it. So I wonder whether it's the fact that it's just there, it doesn't, and also you see phthonos is more active. I mean, I, I claim that Schadenfreude has an active component, but I also think that there is a difference between ha ha ha, something bad happened to you and now I'm happy you feel sorry because I'm saying so, as opposed to, I really hate that something good is happening to you and I'm going to try to do something to, to, to stop it, which is envy. So envy is more dangerous. You can see it more because it's, a, it's an emotion that, that up, upsets, can upset things. Yeah. So so. Aristotle, envy is an emotion that doesn't have any judgment. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
it's it's the it's the worth and the character of the individual who's suffering it mm -hmm. that's determinative. So, with, if you thug, it doesn't matter if the person's good or bad; they don't deserve any good fortune. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's at least how Aristotle analyzes it. Whereas Nemesis is well, that's what you feel when somebody who doesn't deserve gets some good, mm -hmm. gets the good. Mm -hmm. But Aristotle also says at the same time that it's a pleasure neutral mm -hmm. emotion. Mm -hmm. So there's no pleasure the fact that uh, you know if you uh, get a good that you don't deserve and you lose it. There's no pleasure associated with that in Nemesis. No. You just see most of them good people. Yeah. Essie, Kyrie, yeah. Tarkia, uh, for Aristotle, kind of yeah, for, yeah, 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 sure, it's emotional. So it's a kind of a, you say immoral pleasure, I see it's a lot of guilty pleasure. Well, they all experience it, but nobody really wants to be too open about it, except in warfare, which I think. Well, but I think, uh, well, you, if you, I think in, in some cases people, you know, if you take, take tragedy, you yeah. know, so that's a completely different genre. When there is, uh, well, you, you know very well that what I, do, we don't want to have a conversation with no, one by one. But, but I mean, uh, there, there are scenes that in tragedy that's very, little, very, very rarely does the bad person, you know, get what he deserves, and there are not many bad persons, it's complicated. Anyway, in Heracles, there is an episode in which this tyrant was really mean. Uh, he's uh, he's uh, killed uh, the, the legitimate ruler. He wants to kill Heracles, like uh, the family of Heracles, etc. And then eventually Heracles shows up, kills the tyrant, and, and not only the father of Heracles goes in to watch the execution of, uh, of Lycos. And so this, I consider this an absolute example of schadenfreude. Yeah. Whether, the, whether it's called that, uh, I mean, I, I don't know. But, uh, and it's, a, and it's a, a morally justified. In a situation like that, when there's enmity, when the person is morally bad and a morally bad person suffers something bad, How would you call it? Justice. So, in a case like, I mean, there's a man that's Justice is not an emotion, though. Justice. No, I know. Okay. Um, the, 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 another emotion. This one thing, when you've got enmity with somebody, um, and that enmity is deep, like you're in battle or you get violated horribly, like a big piece of cash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, again, I think on, on our model, if you read the modern definitions, they all grapple with how far do we go in extending the range of application of the emotion. And there are many talk about precisely the satis satisfaction that comes from seeing justice done. They call this schadenfreude. Either refuse this. So, you know, yeah, many theory. Many, many contemporary theorists consider this schadenfreude. And basically, they say the greater the misfortune you rejoice over, the more you try to make it seem justified. So the greater the desert of the misfortune. Well, no. No, OK. If I rejoice, I was going to talk, but I, I didn't want to stay too long, to, to speak too long. I don't know if any of you is familiar with uh, Avenue Q. The, right. There is a song, Schadenfreude, there, which I wanted to talk about at the beginning. And it's all like, what is Schadenfreude? It's all defined in the, by, you know, kind of innocent, you know, like a waitress falls, you know, with a tray, an ice skater on his butt. Uh, you know, there is a list of these. Okay. So these you can laugh at, like the athletes, you know, in Ilia 23, who just don't you know, fail. But without, uh, without feeling too bad and without giving a reason, it's just funny. Okay. But if you laugh at, uh, say, I remember reading an article on Schadenfreude two years ago, I think it was, uh, when uh, uh, in Florida, where I mostly live, uh, and it was about Trump's home. So the article said, how far would I go to enjoy Schadenfreude should something happen to Trump's home? And so the greater the damage, the more these speakers had to justify their, their motion by saying that it was absolutely deserved. So say, a little, a little rain, you don't have to say in a hurricane, a major hurricane, fine, yes, he deserves this. A death, well, nobody went that far. So you see, so whereas I think, and I think that's a crucial problem, 
So the entity of the misfortune defines, decides also how you perceive the target, the victim, as, you know, morally speaking. But yes? Um, I, it's a little bit of a follow-up, but um, I was really struck by the differences you were drawing between the world of the Iliad and the world of the Odyssey. And, of course, the Iliad is uh, a type of warfare. And so, you know, I wonder if, if you want to talk about this as, as an emotion that is particularly tied to warlike events or warlike feelings or well, yeah, I, I only talked about these two epics. Yeah. You know, there is a lot, for example, there is a lot of Schadenfreude, the way I see it, in uh, a, a poet, uh, later 7th century, called Archilochus, who is a iambic poet, who, on the contrary, mocks, uh, you know, people there is no war there. It's more somebody who offended him. He offends him and says, I, I hope you be, that my poetry makes you a laughing stock all over the town. So there are, there are other dimensions, social dimensions too. You know, with war, I think the problem with war, and this is something that is methodologically important, to make a distinction between the typical gloating of the warrior himself. And when the warrior kills, you know, in the Iliad, the warrior kills somebody, then he goes and says, ha-ha, you see, you said that you were this, and now here you are, a corpse. I wouldn't consider that schadenfreude, because it's gloating about what you have achieved yourself. Whereas the examples I was giving is, you see, Eurycle in the Odyssey rejoicing over what Odysseus has done, even though she's helped a little bit. Um, and, uh, and, you know, warriors imagine the joy. So it's more imagined, actual, than real. Hmm? And I think that's another thing that I would like to pursue it's more imagined than real in the Iliad, and I think it's because uh, it would not be heroic, perhaps, uh, if uh, a warrior who has not done the fighting should come and boast uh, over the killing of somebody else, somebody who has been killed by somebody else, because warfare in the Iliad is pretty much pretty individualistic. Hmm? So you don't get much of an army you know, going together and rejoicing in the same victory. So I don't know if this is the reason, but uh, well, thank you. Molly. Mm. So, give me a concrete example. Like, oh, sure. So, um, at the very top, where Iliadic heroes are threatening each other with um, the schadenfreude of people you know, who come back empty handed, everybody mm. goes in battle. Mm. And these are people, the imaginary schadenfreude is coming from people who haven't been destroyed, who are totally unrelated, and presumably of those who are in battle. Mm. Well, I think actually the, the way I read these uh, threats of schadenfreude is more in the here and now of the, of the, of the war. So, you know, when uh, Agamemnon, when, uh, you know, Paris, uh, you know, Hector tells Paris, uh, look at you, you know, you're certainly, you're worthless uh, and you are shame for us and laughter for the enemy. He means the Greeks who are right there. But I think your question about the power issue, yes, uh, well, Schadenfreude is, uh, nowadays is really considered by most uh, as, well, not only, uh, Nietzsche called it, called it the revenge of the impotent. So that means uh, it's actually an emotion that puts you up uh, when you actually cannot do anything better 
but having been happy for the destruction, you know, brought out by somebody else. <laughs> So I think, but now without being so negative, modern, modern, well, whole categories between philosophers and psychologists think about precisely about this booster, you know, of recognition. So, for, so the more insecure, to be, the more insecure or the more powerless you think you are, the more likely you are to be prone to Schadenfreude. In, in, that's what. That, Yeah. Does turn out to be fruitless like this, this. right? And so his, his, his imagination of somebody else's joy mm -hmm. in his failure is terrifying. I mean, it's mm -hmm. unendurable. And yeah. Medea is very much. Yes, Medea is Ajax, Ajax yeah. That, that, like this, yeah. Uh, where it's all mm -hmm. tied mm -hmm. in with one sense of honor yeah. and shame. Yeah, well, definitely. Well, I will, I will simplify with reputation, but I thought that included these this ideas. Mm -hmm. so, th so in a way, in that sense, it's certainly aristocratic, but you know, we don't know. Well, but I don't think that even, you have to wait until the philosophers, really, to find those who say I'm indifferent to you know, being laughed at. Uh, even uh, iambic poets would not say that. They are the ones producing laughter than the ones yeah, Right, but so, so it takes, uh, even though, of course, what we know about Greek society is mostly, you know, the aristocratic or the elites. So we don't know whether, you know, so certainly Diogenes the cynic, you know, the philosopher, century cynic philosopher, he wouldn't care, couldn't care because he did everything in such a way as to produce this kind of behavior. Hmm? Uh, like, you know, being filthy, poor, ugly, not, you know, didn't care for honor, didn't care for, for, for shame. Hmm. But in general, I think uh, in all straight of society, from what we know, from, from what I know at least, of archaic and classical Greek literature, you can't really find somebody who says, uh, ha, 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 laugh at me and, uh, because I don't care about you know, your value, except if you are a Socrates. Well, it does, you see, he has to keep it in. Odysseus has, cannot reveal his identity, and so he has to swallow it. But I don't think he's indifferent. In, in my Odysseus book, I, I make... He endures it. But he endures it. That's different from uh, being, you know, being indifferent to it. So. Yeah, I see. If you don't want to make it public, we can... Uh, now, mosey over to the table and, and, and give her a chance. So, before we do that, let's all have a big round of applause. Okay. applause. So,